Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Let's turn to 521. 521, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We'll sing all four verses. 521. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. Redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty thy king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings upon us and your goodness. We do pray for those that are under the weather today, that you would help them. And we pray that you'd help us as we consider the word. We're thankful for the internet where we can stream and whatnot and people can join us virtually and we're thankful for those that could be here physically. And we do thank you as we uh, can't help but think of a couple years ago when we were forced to stream only, we thank you that we don't have to do that anymore and that we can meet together and encourage one another and pray as church. We just thank you. We pray you be pleased with all that's said and done here today, and that you'd work on our hearts and that we'd apply what you have for us this week. Well, thank you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Turn to 204, if you would please, Rock of Ages. 204, we'll sing all the verses. 204, all four verses, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flow be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. 
naked come to thee for dress helpless look to thee for grace foul i to the fountain fly wash me savior or i die while i draw this fleeting breath when my eyes shall close in death when i soar to worlds unknown see thee on thy judgment throne rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee amen take your bulletin if you would please and if you don't have one phoebe's got them back there please just raise your hand and let her know but we have food if you would need some. We have the ladies' Bible study coming up in just a couple weeks, and the same week we'll have the church cleaning. We've been keeping an eye on the COVID cases, and it seems that COVID's pretty much bottomed out in Hamilton County, so we're thankful for that. It's nice when you can look and the daily case rate is the lowest it's been since this thing started two years ago. So we praise the Lord for that. The seven day average is about six. So that's nice. So if you're worried about uh, masks or not wearing masks or what have you, it's, pre it, it's not going, I, I don't think it'll ever fully go away, but it's very, 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 very low. So we praise the Lord for that. And so we're looking at uh, having the Lord's Supper probably next month, which starts next week. So April's coming up on us very quickly. So we have two write-ups for you again by Mr. Ryle, one on looking away from self and towards Christ, the other on hold your possessions loosely. Then you have a quote from Mr. Ryle, Mr. Spurgeon, and another one from Mr. Mueller, and that's a more lengthy one, but I hope, hope you'll read it, take it to heart. George Mueller was another one of those men who he's long past, but he was a godly individual. We have his biography back there, if you care to read it. But he was a man that trusted the Lord for his living. And people look to him and say, well, I could never have the faith that George Mueller had. And nothing that George Mueller did or had was for his benefit or his glory. You know, a lot of what we have, the, uh, oh, I'm having faith nowadays is just for the glory of man. George Mueller eventually came to run an orphanage and several other institutions, ministries, and they were just run on faith meaning he trusted the God of the Bible and trusted the promises of God's word to make it work, and God made it work. He didn't go around begging for money or holding fundraisers or doing all the nonsense that is done today. He did things God's way, and God made it work. And people look at Mr. Mueller and say, oh, that could never happen today. People don't, people don't try. People don't try. It does work because God's word is as true as it was a couple hundred years ago as it was 2,000 years ago. And God's certainly not dead. He does take care of our needs. We praise him for that. So I hope you'll read that quote. I hope you'll pick up that biography in the back and read it. It'll be an encouragement to you if you've never read it. Um, you, you can pick up good biographies like those. If you don't want to borrow them, you can pick them up for a couple dollars, usually at any given time on websites like eBay and thrift books and what have you. But regardless, Phoebe is going to play for you this morning out of hymn number 435, which is What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Okay, thank you, Phoebe. It's 4.35, which is what a friend we have in Jesus. Okay, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 13, if you would. We'll continue our study on godly love. And it seems that we're wrapping this up. I can't see there being any more than one or two more services on this. Unless we really get hung up on something. But when you run into verse number 7 all the way down to verse number 12, you have a summary, really, of what Paul is trying to say under inspiration of the Spirit of God. You have verses number uh, 4 through 6 really defining what it is, verses 1 and 13 giving the introduction and conclusion, basic, or 1 through 3 and 13, giving the introduction and the conclusion, basically saying the same things about godly love. And so let's look at that. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 13, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning, help us to be a people that exhibit godly love in our lives, not the love that this world promotes, not the love that we even think or feel in our hearts, but the love that you define for us and give to us through your spirit, pray that you would help us and that we would please you with our lives. We'll thank you and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're on for the series, part 92, for this little series, we're on letter L of the outline and that is charity summarized, basically, or godly love summarized, in that it says it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things, and it does not fail. Now, we're going to cover these the next uh, couple services, and the first part today, of course, as it seems Paul's just rather summarizing what he already said in verse number one through three, stating charity above all. It should be our focus, the first and foremost of the spiritual fruits that we seek to bring forth in our lives. And Paul even says, under inspiration of the Spirit of God, therefore God himself says, it is the greatest of the spiritual fruits. Well, what is it? Number two, we look at the fact that it is patient or long-suffering, suffereth long. Number three, it is kind. Number four, it envies not. Number five, it vaunts not or brags not upon itself. Number six, it is not puffed up or is not full of itself. It is not prideful. Number seven, it does not behave itself unseemly or it acts appropriately. Number eight, it does not seek its own. Number nine, it is not easily provoked. Number 10, it does not think evil. We covered that recently, thinks no evil, does not hold a grudge against another one. Number 11, it rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. We just covered that on Wednesday. It does not rejoice in iniquity. The world says, hey, I'm living in sin. Rejoice with me as I live in sin. No, no, no. God's people don't do that. We don't do that. We may not look and rebuke the world, but we 
we find that balance, we find that middle ground where we say, no, I, I can't be a part of that. I'm sorry because it's wrong. We don't rejoice in iniquity, but we rejoice in the truth. And what is truth? God's word is truth, right? We rejoice when someone follows after the Lord, not when they run around saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. No, when they act like a Christian. I've gotten in the, in the little, maybe it's a little fad right now, of posting little, I finally d d discovered how to post little polls online for people, and I can't do it on Twitter because I don't have the follower base. Facebook's kind of useless in that regard, um, but I, I was able to do it on Reddit and ask the question, how, what do you believe is a Christian? And I had a good couple, several hundred people reply to that. What do you believe as a Christian? And most people today say, whoever says they are. Most people say, whoever says they're a Christian. That means Catholics, Protestants, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon. Whoever says they're a Christian is a Christian, the world thinks. And a smaller, much smaller percentage, about a third, if not a quarter, say whoever proves they are. And that's the right answer. Whoever is a Christian is whoever proves they are, according to God's word, right? Because we can say we're something all the live long day and not prove it, but we have to prove it, as the Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. We rejoice in the truth. You find someone who lives according to God's word, that's a rare treasure indeed, and we should rejoice in that and befriend those people if at all possible. Now we're on the last part, which is letter L. I know I've been going my numbers previously, but letter L on my outline, whatever the number is next, because I've lost it in my mind, where is charity summarized. It bears, believes, hopes, endures, and it never fails. And so we're going to look at probably three of those today. Uh, the first being that it bears all things. It bears all things. What do you think that means? Uh, the definition that we find through the original languages means to bear up against, hold out against, and so to endure, bear, or forbear. The root of this word, if you're interested, is literally speaking of a roof. The root word is a noun, Greek word for roof, holding up a building, or not holding up a building, the building holds up the roof, right? To bear up against, to hold out against, and so to endure, bear, or forbear. We get the idea of holding out. Um, let me give you a few things. One, Paul was willing to suffer all things lest the gospel be hindered. And two, Paul learned to be content amidst his suffering. Godly love bears all things. It means it keeps going no matter what. It doesn't quit no matter what is thrown at it. Paul in 2 Corinthians gives a list of all the things that were thrown at him. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was stoned to, even unto death. He was whipped and scourged. He was chased out of certain cities. He had his very life threatened. And for what? Just because he preached the gospel. But he was willing to suffer. Jesus himself says, take up your cross and follow me. Are you willing to suffer for his sake? That doesn't mean get nailed to a cross or even get whipped and beaten. But are you even willing? I mean, people today can't even handle it if someone says a wrong thing to them because they act like a Christian. And yes, words do hurt, just like actions do hurt. Are you willing, because of your godly love for Christ, to endure the abuse of the world? Are you willing to endure the endure the abuse of your family and friends and what have you. 
1 Corinthians 9, verse number 3, Paul says he's willing to suffer all things lest the gospel be hindered. Why don't we do certain things and why do we do others? Why is there a line of separation? Why is there a standard that we live by, which is to be the word of God, not be the word of God? Why do we hold to that and not just do whatever we want? Because doing whatever we want mars the name of Christ. Holding to God's word, just like George Mueller did and plenty of others before him, by God's grace, it involves some suffering, it involves endurance. That's why the Christian walk is likened unto running a race. You know, run the race that's set before us. Run, uh, 2 Timothy 2 talks about running for mastery, you know, running according to the rules and what have you. Well, Paul's talking about 1 Corinthians 9, enduring all things for the gospel, so the gospel not be hindered, so the name of Christ is not dragged through the mud. 1 Corinthians 9 says, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Paul had his critics. He had those that nitpicked at him. He had those that dragged his name through the mud and marred, tried to mar his testimony before others. And Paul's addressing that and says, my answer to them that examined me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister or wife as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Paul's just explaining to these people that would criticize him and say, well, Paul, he, he doesn't, uh, do anything but take money from people and this, that, and the other. And Paul says, listen, guys, aren't we human beings? Don't we have families that we have to provide for? Don't we have the need to eat and drink because we're human, right? We need food and water. He says, who goeth a warfare, in verse 7, anytime at his own charges? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? You don't go to war and pay for it yourself. The government pays for it for you, right? The government says, hey, we're going to war, and looks at you and me and says, hey, you're fighting in this war. We look expectantly and say, okay, are you going to provide the helmet? Are you going to provide the armor? Are you going to provide the weapons? And they, of course, would. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? I mean, we all expect, if we do the work, we get to partake of the work. And Paul says, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? See, the ox was supposed to tread out the corn, and God said, don't muzzle the ox. Let the ox eat his fill because he's doing work. If you work, you should eat, right? So, or saith he it altogether for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. And Paul's building up to something because these people are criticizing him, remember. And he's saying, we've done this work, we go about. And there's people out there that say, well, the ministry's not work. I can tell you from my standpoint, the ministry is definitely work. Now, there, are there people that take advantage of the ministry, though? Yes. Yes. And they have no business being in it, and they ought to be cast out of it. The ministry ought to be like any other job in that respect where work is put in and hard work right? If I tell my kids, you go to Ace and you go to Arby's and you put in, if you're working for eight hours, you better put in eight hours worth of work. If you expect to be paid for eight hours worth of work, you, you don't go to work to lay around and do nothing. And the ministry should be no different where the pastor's not expected to lay around all week and just come in and preach on Sunday and Wednesday and just lay around and do nothing. No, no, no. 
It is work if it is done as it should be. And that's what Paul's trying to explain. Hey, we work, Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Paul's ministry team, you know, Priscilla and Aquila and whatnot. We work. And Paul did work, by the way, Acts chapter 20 and other parts of Acts show that he actually did go and work a secular job, what we say, as he went about mending tents. And so he was not a slacker, not by any means. And so he says in verse 11, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He says, guys, we may not work like you do. We may not go out all day in a fishing boat. We may not go out all day selling goods. We may not go out all day doing this, that, or the other in the secular world. He says, but we have sown the spiritual things. And the work of the ministry is just that, sowing the spiritual things. It is giving, the, the minister is supposed to be the expert on God's word, right? The expert on God's word. And able, you know, what is one requirement of a pastor in 1 Timothy 3? Apt to teach. That means able and willing. Sowing of spiritual things. When my wife and I, and my wife's not even, I mean, she ministers in her own right, but she's not a pastor, of course. We go about and we teach these things that are in the Bible that people don't know nowadays because they're not taught. Like she's teaching modesty and identity in Sunday school and people outright reject for one reason or another and aren't taught why men and women ought to be modest. People outright reject, I talk about music standards, people outright reject those things and they're not taught. Whole thing with the King James and Bible versions, people outright reject and they're not taught. You know, my dad went, I may have told the story here, he went for years, first generation Christian, went to Longmeadow Church of the Brethren, then Battlefield Bible Church, and then ended up at uh, the church he's at now, and it wasn't until then that he learned why we use the King James. It was all, well, just do whatever you want, oh, or we use it, but I can't tell you what. That should never be. We need to have a doctrinal standard for these things. We need to, I need to be able to look at you and say, we do this because the Bible says this. Not because that's what we've always done. And Paul didn't do that. He taught them everything they needed to know. The whole counsel of God, as it's called. I just touched on three, three things that aren't taught today. I mean, there's even more serious things that aren't taught today of the doctrine of salvation, of the doctrine of Christ, of the doctrine of uh, the doctrines that we teach off of those 10 great doctrines of the Bible. So Paul says, if we've sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He says, I've, I've given you the gospel, I've given you this, that, or the other, and all I want to do is be able to keep doing that and keep going about starting churches, so why the big, he's, why the big deal? What's the big problem? And of course, the big problem is that the devil gets in people's hearts and minds and people start to nitpick that want nothing to do with God's word. But he's trying to reason with them and says, if others be partakers of this power over you, so there, there's other people that were partakers of this power, as it were, and they would go about like they do today and they would beg for money and they're on your TV sets and they show up in your mailbox, right? And I know they do because they show up here <laughs> all the time asking for money. Sometimes they show up on your doorstep. Would you support us? Would you support us? Would you support us? And, you know, people, people do that sort of thing. Um, and then generally the, there's others that suffer for it, but that's not 
what this sermon is about. If others be partakers of this power, Paul says, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. We have not used this power. Paul says, in other words, I've not stood up and said, hey guys, I need money. Hey guys, I need your support. Hey guys, I need your help. Paul, like George Mueller, or George Mueller, like Paul, <laughs> um, relied on God to provide for his needs and to put upon people's hearts to give. He never stood, they never stood up and said, hey guys, I need this. Why? Because they believed, and I agree with them, they believed it would be a bad testimony. We see so much of that today, don't we? Everybody is asking for money nowadays. Everybody is asking for money. Uh, many people, for no good reason, I know of, of ministers that, hey, I need help funding my book. <laughs> I need help funding this project I'm working on or that project. What, what did, uh, when did we lose our faith that if God wants it to happen, it'll happen? When did we stop believing, spend within your means? Well, we stopped believing that when we started being given over to our flesh and said, well, I believe God wants me to build a bigger church building or to start this random ministry that's going to cost more money for the church and the church doesn't have it. I believe it, and thus it must be right. I just read that in First Chronicles 22, I think where David wanted to build that great temple. I talked about it on Wednesday night. When David wanted to build that temple to the Lord and God was dwelling in the tents of the tabernacle and God said, hey, if I wanted, if it bothered me to dwell in the tents of the tabernacle, wouldn't I say something? You have Nathan saying, oh yeah, just do whatever, David. Your heart's in the right place, it'll be fine. And God said, no, 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 no. That's not what I want. Just because we feel something doesn't mean God wants it. But did you know, that's how I grew up believing. You may be well and I may be well-meaning, but just because it's a desire on our heart doesn't mean it's God-given. And we can pretty much know if it's outside of the price range we don't have the money to do it, probably not God's will. If God wants it to happen, he will make it work. I've even seen that. I could tell you stories about that. Paul refused to live with the fundraising mentality. He re believed it marred the ministry of the gospel. And it has today, hasn't it? How many people sit back and say, oh, he's just all about money. Ah, there he goes, asking for money again, right? It happens, Whew. happens, especially in the mega churches. It was all the time in our college that we went to, all the time, wasn't it, dear? Just because they felt they needed to purchase property or they needed to build buildings and what have you. Regardless, pulses. We have not used this power, but suffer all things. That word suffer is the same word that we're talking about to bear. Paul says, I would rather sit under the burden. I would rather suffer and endure, if you will, not having enough instead of going to you and begging for money and it hurt the ministry of the gospel. That's why he says, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And I would say emphatically, the gospel has been greatly hindered because our country's full of churches that are just all about themselves, right? Do ye not know, Paul says, that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now he goes into the law and he starts to compare, and there's a lot of comparisons I've learned over the years, if you want to look for yourself, between the Levitical priesthood and being a New Testament minister. There's a lot of comparisons. There's a lot of differences, too. But there's a lot of good things to learn from it. And this is one. 
that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. What's it talking about? It's talking about the fact that the Levitical priests lived off of what came off the altar. They lived off the tithes that were brought in to the temple. The tithes were given to the maintenance of the temple, uh, the ministry of the temple. Yes, it was given to the some was given to the poor, but also so that the priests could focus on being priests and not have to go out, plow the fields and whatnot. Their work was the spiritual work, if you will. And even their food came off the tithes and from the sacrifices. If you read in the law, it wasn't, that meat wasn't wasted it was given to the priests and divided amongst the Levites. And that's what he's talking about. They which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. You say, well, where did the, the priest's food come from? It came right from there. Not to demean the sacrifices, but they were barbecuing all day, every day, weren't they? <laughs> it's what they were doing. And so it says, even so, there's a very practical use, is my point. It says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I've used, Paul says, none of these things. This may be a thing that should be done, Paul says, but it's not a thing I'm going to force into being done. He says, I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so unto me. And this you can really appreciate Paul's attitude, can't you? How good is it to hear of a man that's not focused on himself, where he says, I'm not telling you this so that you can do it to me. I'm not telling you this to bully you. I'm not telling you this to make you feel guilty about not doing what you should have. I'm just telling you what God's word says. How good is that? And he does that several times in his writings where he says, guys, I don't want to say this about myself. I don't want this to be all about Paul. I want it to be all about Christ. He says, neither have I written these things that it should be done so unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity, talking about duty. You know, we, we think about duty often in regards to the military, in regards to the police and things like that. They have a duty to perform. But the God-following, God-honoring minister believes it's his duty to do what he does because it's God's calling. Not for money's sake, not for adoration of people, but because it's a God-given calling. He says, necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Why did Paul do what he did? Because he had to. He went about starting churches not to make money, not to gain fame, but because it was his job. It was his job. A lot of ministers don't like that um, analogy that the ministry is a job. But the fact is, it is a job. It's a job of someone called by God to do it. And how do they know that they're called by God? One is that they can't do anything else. Though they could, it's not that they're, you know, like they're not skilled to do anything else in life. It's that within themselves, they can't go do anything else and be happy, be at peace. They have to do what God's called them to do. It is a calling of God. It is a job. And Paul understood that. He says, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Just like Jimmy's job, woe unto me if I don't go to Arby's and work in the drive-thru. And Phoebe, woe unto me if I don't go to Ace and make sure that home decor is just spick and span, right? 
It's the job. You say, well, God's called them to do that as much as anyone else. Sure, yeah. Woe unto Andrea if she doesn't do school to the best of her ability. And Jimmy. And anyone else. It's a job. It's a calling. I know we haven't been taught to think that way, but we ought to think that way. Paul says, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel... I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. That no one from the outside can look in and say, I just did it for the money. I don't need to believe in his Jesus because he's just in it for the money. I don't need to believe God's word because look at all the creeps and all the, you know, that are in that work, doing that work. They're just in it for money or power or fame or to abuse people or whatever. Now, Paul says one of his rewards is that he preached the gospel knowing that if anyone doesn't believe it, it's on them because pretty much he's right with God. No one can say oh, he's, just, he's just all that time asking for money <laughs> as people do. He's willing to suffer all things lest the gospel be hindered. And that's the way it ought to be, by the way. That's the way it ought to be. He had the ability. It's not that he didn't have the ability to ask for money or to do certain things, use his quote-unquote power, but he refused to. Um, rather akin to the statement that goes around in the world, just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Well, how do we know what we should and shouldn't do as Christians? God's word tells us. Tells us. Number two, or letter B, Paul learned to be content amidst his sufferings. Paul learned to be content. One great problem we have today is that we are not taught that the Christian walk is a war. We're not taught that the Christian walk includes some amount, if not for, for some, a great amount of suffering. We're not taught that there will be persecution if we follow Christ. We're not taught that the world, flesh, and devil will come after us if we follow Christ. Instead, we are made to think that everything's going to come up daisies and everything's going to be just wonderful and everyone's going to applaud when you follow Jesus. And yes, we will hear in the church, but the world is not going to. We have to learn with God's help to bear all things. And part of loving Christ, loving others, is being content, like Paul, amidst sufferings. When people say things about you, even to your face, and you develop with God's help that thick skin to be able to shrug and walk away. Philippians 4 and verse number 10, the Bible says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Paul says to the church at Philippi that they helped him. And the church at Philippi remembered him at certain times. Not that he sought money, but they did help him because they no doubt gave themselves to the Lord. They loved Paul. And he says, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want. He says, I'm not saying these things because I lack anything. He says, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be Content. Paul's writing this from jail, remember. He's writing this from prison. It's one of the prison epistles. He is suffering to a certain degree. 
Paul says, I know how, both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But verse 13, which we probably know very well, he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul could have gone about abusing his power in the gospel. He could have gone about focusing on what so many focus on today, which is comfort and pleasure. Me, 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 me. Make me feel good. Make sure I'm comfortable. That's what the church is focused on, too. That's why people enjoy going to certain congregations. They can go there and they can feel good. And people say, oh, I listened to so-and-so's preaching and it made me feel good. That's not what preaching's for. Well, praise the Lord if you have some bit of encouragement through the word of God. But the focus is not to be feeling good. It's to be learning to apply God's word so we can be more like Christ. See, the focus of so many is off today. I'm not going to go far down this road, but I ran into that recently, too, where ministers talking. And one said, well, the, the people, the attendance is not the only way to prove God's uh, blessing or prove success in the church. And I said, that's not any way to prove success in the church. First Timothy 6 says so. it's not any way. Attendance numbers and numbers in general are not to be the goal. Someone said, oh, yeah, that's right. The, the goal is to be who you're ministering to. And basically to minister to as many people as you can. And I said, no, that's not the goal either. <laughs> Praise God for any person you can minister to. But that's not the goal the goal is always, always, always to be Christ. And following him according to his word. He is the goal. And as we follow Christ according to his word, everything else falls into place as he wants it to. That's the mindset of Paul here. That's the mindset of people like George Mueller that we talk about. Everything falls into place, not as we expected and probably not as we hoped, <laughs> but it does work out. And when it works out and we're out of the equation, our flesh and our pride, then we know that whatever has happened is God's will. Whatever has happened is what God wants to have happen, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, it's done for his purposes to make us more like Christ. It's done for his glory. That's what Paul's saying here. I'm not going about whining that I'm in prison and whoa, is Paul, he's in prison again. He's not going about whining that he doesn't have food or whining that he doesn't have clothing. He's going about whining for money, whining that he's uncomfortable. He says, I can do all things. How? Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It bears all things. The world says, I can't take it anymore. I'll be honest with you, folks. There's been many times the past 10 whatever years, even before that, where I've said, I can't take it anymore. And my wife here, I would say recently, but not recently within the last couple weeks, but within the last several months, she said, fine, quit. And I say, I can't. Because of Christ. Not because I'm some great individual of faith. The world says, I can't take it anymore. That's why people get divorces. That's why people abandon their families. That's why people jump from church to church to church. That's why people jump from job to job to job. <laughs> and people abandon. They think the next one's going to be better. The next marriage, the next job, the next position, the next church. And you know, sometimes, sometimes it's 
needed, of course. But that's the exception, not the rule. It's the habit today of the world to jump from place to place, person to person, instead of dedicating themselves. The world says, I can't take it anymore. They, they use their suffering or supposed suffering. Yeah, most of what people call suffering isn't, right? It's just an excuse. And they use it as an excuse to abandon their posts. And there's none of this with the believer that brings forth godly love in their lives. There is no, I can't take it anymore. There is, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Oh, we may feel it, we can even say it, but we have to go back to Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. And it's not all things whatsoever we can contrive in our minds <laughs> or feel in our hearts. It's whatever is God's will. We can do that. We can do that with his help for his glory, right? Godly love bears all things. Number two, this will be about as far as we get probably today. It believes all things. Now, what it's not saying and what it's very easy to assume here is that it's saying that godly love just believes whatever it hears. <laughs> and that's not, that's not what it's saying at all. It does mean to think to be true and to trust in, but it's not a blind trust. You and I need to have discernment Godly discernment, not bad discernment, but godly discernment about our lives. The ability to tell right from wrong. So there's, again, you have this balance. It's not a blind trust, but it is giving individuals the benefit of the doubt when the context deems it to be prudent. The only person we can blindly trust is who? Jesus Christ, right? Right? Anything he says in his word, anything God puts forth in his word, we can blindly trust in Christ. He's, that's, that's why we're here, you know, and we know he will never do us any wrong. We worship him, we follow him, we believe in him. Yes, by faith, not by sight. But understand two things. One, godly love does not destroy prudence. Godly love does not destroy prudence. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 15. Now to every aspect of something that we study, especially here today, there is work that needs to be done, isn't there? There is a part where the world does not line up with it. And the world wants to say, oh, just believe everything. Everybody has your best interests at heart. And the world itself knows that's not true. But they want you to be a person that blindly believes whatever because they want your blind allegiance, your blind following, you to be just this individual that doesn't think. And by the way, there's plenty of ministers like that too. Oh, I don't need to read your Bible. That's why the Catholic Church hated the English Bible coming out and especially hundreds of years ago, because they didn't want the commoner to be able to read it for themselves. The Catholic Church knew that when the common man would be able to read the Bible for themselves, they would read it and start to say, well, what that guy is saying and what this is saying don't line up because Catholic doctrine, Catholic dogma is not Bible doctrine. The Catholics pick and choose what they want, just like the best of them, and that's all they would promote. But regardless, we have to be a thinking people, a thinking people. So godly love does not destroy prudence. Proverbs 14, verse number 15, the Bible says, the simple believeth every word. Remember, there's four different individuals in the book of Proverbs. There's the wise individual. The wise individual is those that hold to God's word, they believe it, right? They study to follow it. There's the simple, the simple are what we call ignorant. Ignorant's not a bad word, it just means you don't know. And there's plenty of things in life I don't know so that I'm ignorant in, right? That's what simple means. 
but we shouldn't be simple individuals that are not only unlearned or ignorant, but that believe whatever we hear. The wise will go and be as those Bereans in the book of Acts. That what they hear, they would search the scriptures to see if it was true. Then you have, of course, the fools. The fools are those that reject God's word. And the scorners are those fools that not only reject God's word, but seek to recruit others to also reject God's word. So you have those four. And so you have the simple. The simple just believe whatever. It says the simple believeth every word. But the prudent man looketh well to his going. Or he knows what he's doing is right. He walks circumspectly. We just talked about this recently. He walks circumspectly. His steps are accurate. He may not know everything about what's going to happen, but he knows what he's doing as far as God's will is God's will. He looketh well to his going. So the word prudent here, according to Webster, means cautious or circumspect. Practically wise. There's not a whole lot of practical individuals in the world today, are there? Practically wise, careful of the consequences of enterprises, measures, or actions, cautious not to act when the end is of doubtful utility or practically impracticable. Practicable, yes. So if you want any part of that definition, cautious <laughs> would be the most important one to remember. Prudent means cautious. You don't just jump into anything. If you want a life lesson that I've learned, you, you probably agree with me, uh, is don't just make decisions like that. I've seen ministers do that, and, and I... I've done that myself, and I was a fool for doing it. I didn't know any better, but I was a fool for doing it. When people walk up or a decision's given to you, and, okay, we'll support that person as a missionary. Don't know a thing about them. Okay, we'll have that person as a church member. Don't know a thing about them. Okay, we'll do this, that, or the other. No, wait a Prudent individuals are cautious. We don't just make decisions. We prove things, right? And we prove it especially against the word of God. Just because we love someone doesn't destroy our cautiousness. It doesn't mean believe everything you hear. I know people, especially family, it's hard because there are family members and I've counseled with them uh, in the jails and what have you, and you hear about it uh, in various places. Family members are some of the worst. They'll just, they'll take advantage of familial love. Oh, well, so-and-so loves me. They would never rake me across the coals. They would never rob my bank account. They would never cheat me. They would ne and they do, and they do. We have to know, not assume, right? We have to be prudent, cautious in making our decisions. Godly love, secondly, does not destroy judgment, or we could say discernment. Discernment. We look at things today, and you look at the world, and, and the world's going to act like the world, and you may say, well, why in the world did they do that? It's largely because they're unsaved. There are some that are worldly wise. They know how the world works, and they're very good at playing the game, and so they've made themselves money, right, and, and things like that. that. That's fine, but there's plenty of others, plenty of others. I, I saw one who said, um, for instance, with the stock market, I would never recommend that you play the stock market because that's a, exactly what it is, playing. <laughs> Gambling. Stock market's just how, how people with money gamble as opposed to the lottery, which is how people who don't have money gamble, right? I wouldn't play either because you can't trust either one. Go with what's a certainty, right? But this person online said, I lost $90,000 in stocks. And you cringe at that and you feel 
bad for the person. They say, how can I make this money back? And I'm thinking, get out of the stock market. Because <laughs> you can't trust it. You can trust in work and honest days wage, right? Daily and save up your money and live on a budget. You can largely control those things. You can't control what the stock market does. You can't. Now, you hear of stories of people who do very well. You also hear stories of people who do very poorly. Godly love does not destroy judgment. And yet, you hear of believers that have very bad judgment with various things. And you say, why? It's because they don't follow God's word. John chapter 7, verse 24 Jesus says, judge not according to appearance. Don't judge according to how something appears. It may appear very well. It may appear very godly. That's why I look at folks and I tell folks anymore, don't support these random ministries out there for the helpless, the homeless, the orphans, the this, the that, the other. It doesn't matter how long you've supported them. It doesn't matter what they are. Everything of that sort that calls itself a ministry, well, one, on their side, it ought to be under a local church, under that authority. And on our side, it ought to be supported by a local church. Maybe people in the church want to get behind it. Or maybe we've never heard of it before. Maybe it's a terrible thing. Maybe it is a scam. And I know that or my wife knows that. And we can help you understand that it is such. Or it's a ministry that should never be supported. Or maybe it's this great thing that everyone can be a part of. It ought to be done through the local church. At time and time again. Time and time again, you hear money wasted to, to these places and these people because they appear good. I couldn't tell you the missionaries that I passed up, though, because of the red flags. Seriously, the missionaries that want to live like kings over in a foreign land, the missionaries that don't give any information about themselves online, but they're, they're a missionary. The missionaries even, one I went to college with, he says he's a missionary so-called to, uh, I forget what, Kenya, and he's not been to Kenya for years. He's a YouTuber now, and he's under support and getting YouTube follower support. And he's very popular on YouTube, and the best I can do is warn people away from him. His name's Spencer Smith. If you ever come across him, please just toss him away. It just fakes that are out there. Fakes. We need to have good discernment. And I know you all don't live in the world of ministry, but I do. That's why I can help. If you ever come across and you're wondering, is this a good thing to support? I could probably help with that. Just because we love someone or something we sh does not mean we should throw discernment out the window. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. What is righteous judgment? It is judging according to the word of God. How do we know how we ought to act towards the government? The Bible tells us. How do we know how we ought to act in the church? The Bible tells us. How do we know how we ought to act as parents and children? The Bible tells us. How do we know how do we ought to act in the workplace? The Bible tells us all of it. How to make business decisions. What do we ought to do with our money? What we ought to do with our goods? It's not put it on the stock market or even give it all to the church. There are, there are preachers that preach, give your inheritance, not to your family, but to the churches. And they're, they're wrong. <laughs> oh, my. Don't they, dear? Oh, yeah, I've heard that preaching. Pastors focusing on, on you getting the church into your will. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I don't care about your money. I care about you following Jesus. Please follow Jesus. <laughs> Please. 
And that's how we know what God wants, as the Bible tells us. Godly love does not destroy judgment. If there's one thing that the world and carnal churches or ministers hate, it's a thinking individual. It's a person that will hear even what you're hearing today and compare it to Scripture. They hate that. Because they want the control. And some part of them knows they're doing wrong. I have to, I have to imagine, maybe they're completely deluded, I don't know. But some in, part of them has to know what, that what they're doing is wrong. Like Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer and all that crowd. They have to know that what they're doing is wrong. Maybe they don't. Maybe they're just fully deluded. Godly love believes all things. I'll read two things and we'll be done. One, Matthew Henry says this. Matthew Henry and John Calvin give commentary on this. I, I think it's very good. Matthew Henry says, Indeed, charity does by no means destroy prudence. And out of mere simplicity and silliness, believe every word. I have to say this because I'm, there's plenty of people that will say, Oh, it believes all things. That means it just believes the best of everybody. No, no, no. Does not, but out of mere simplicity and silliness, believe every word. Wisdom may dwell with love and charity be cautious. But it is apt to believe well of all, to entertain a good opinion of them when there is no appearance to the contrary. Meaning, if I don't know Jimmy, and people say, he's a good guy, then I don't come up to him and thinking, oh, he's a bad guy. <laughs> There's no appearance to the contrary. Nay, to believe well, when there may be some dark appearances, if the evidence be ill, uh, evidence of ill be not clear. In other words, you give people the benefit of the doubt. Unless you have evidence otherwise, unless you know that something's wrong, not assume something's wrong, but you know something's wrong, you give people the benefit of the doubt. That's the balance. You don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you see. You give people benefit of the doubt unless, unless you know otherwise. Calvin says, love believeth all things, not that the Christian knowingly and willingly allows himself to be imposed upon. You see, there's, there's a thought out there, oh, we'll just let people run you over. <laughs> just, you give everyone everything and you just give everyone what their heart desires. You just let them run you. No, that's, that's not godly love. There's a balance there. Doesn't the Bible say, as you have opportunity right? Meaning if you can do good and you ought to do good, they're worthy of it, meaning they're following the Lord, they love the Lord. You have opportunity to do good, not just do whatever. <laughs> this whole do whatever willy-nilly uh, and, and never investigate and never do your due diligence and never yeah, is ridiculous. It's infiltrated many, many, many churches and homes. Not that the Christian knowingly and willingly allows himself to be imposed upon. Now, there's times people will take you for a ride, right? You know what that term means. They'll cheat you <laughs> in some way. They will take you for a ride. You will be, people will take you for granted or take advantage of you. Even when you, you do your best to avoid that, that will happen, right? Understand being a nice person, <laughs> being a nice person means that you are setting yourself up to be hurt a lot in life. Understand that because it's just the truth. Following Christ sets you up for that. But we go into, that doesn't mean shut down and close in on yourself and never help anyone, no. It just means do your due diligence. And if you get hurt, understand that just goes with the territory. There are people, there are people that will do that. But we don't knowingly and willingly allow ourselves to be imposed upon. It says, love believeth all things, not that he divests himself of prudence and judgment. 
right? We don't cast those things away, as we just looked at, that he may be the more easily taken advantage of. Not that he unlearns the way of distinguishing black and white. <laughs> there is right and wrong. Who are those we ought to help, the Bible says. Focus on helping those believers that are following Christ. Not Joe, what's his face, out there just doing whatever. Not Joe in our family just doing whatever. But those that are following Christ. Those brethren, the Bible says over and over again. We don't unlearn the way of distinguishing black from white. Well, what then? He requires here, Calvin says, as I've already said, simplicity and kindness in judging of things. And he declares those are invariable accompaniments of love. Just very similar to what Matthew Henry said. And commentators aren't always right. Okay. But sometimes they do say some very good things that I can't say any better, which is why I'm reading it for you. So charity, godly love, bears all things. If you say you're a Christian, which everyone here this morning says they are and has fruit thereof, it bears all things. We have godly love in our lives. It means we're going to go through the ringer at times. We're going to suffer, but God will help us through that suffering. There's many other passages that I alluded to that speak of that. And we have to learn to be willing to suffer if it's required of us, willing to bear these sufferings, lest the gospel be hindered and learn to be content in the midst of them so that the gospel is not hindered, right? Not say with the world, I just can't take it anymore, so I'm going to run to place or person X, Y, Z. No, we say by God's grace, he'll help us to make it through because we trust him. And it not only bears all things, but believes all things. It doesn't destroy our prudence or our judgment. It doesn't destroy our discernment. But it gives people in the right context the benefit of the doubt instead of being constantly, and I have to fight against this, constantly skeptical of individuals. Constantly skeptical of individuals. When there's no reason to be skeptical, we're not for when there's good evidence. Father, I pray that you would help us today and that we would please you. Help us to, again, be a people of godly love. And we'll thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, Sarah's going to come and play. Maybe God spoke to your heart in a certain way. Maybe you're going through a hard time right now. And or maybe you have, and, and, or maybe you're headed to one, and you're going to, or you have felt like just quitting, just give it all up. And you need to determine to turn to Christ and trust in his help. I mean, I can plead all day long, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. But it comes to the individual to say, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep following Christ. Maybe, maybe there's some thing that we need to work on as far as judgment, discernment. Or maybe there's something else. What has God spoken to you about today? Let's stand together. Sarah's going to play. Take this time to talk to the Lord.
Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would help us as we go about with the rest of the week, that we would take what we've heard today and apply it, and that no matter what comes, you would help us to stand firm, help us to not hurt the gospel in any way, but to give it and be good testimonies of it. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for Jesus most of all. Came, died for us, rose from the dead so we could be saved and live in a way that pleases you. We thank you and give you the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 349 if you would please. Trust and obey. We'll sing the first verse. 349, trust and obey. First one. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey god bless you for being here this morning please do uh, pray for those that are out sick Heather's got a headache and whatnot, so please do pray for those, and we hope you have a good week, and we'll see you Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Lord willing. God bless you.